we continue our time with you, Helen, with a few please. questions? I'm sure there'll be some. Okay, so please. Okay. So all the examples that you saw in Canada are in Latin. Yes. Did you find any in Irish? And yes. This, this particular tradition, it's all in Latin. But the, the stories, like the, the manuscript that I was quoting from, the Book of Lismore, that is in Irish. So the, the medieval sources, most of the liturgical ones were Latin because the liturgy was sung in Latin. So the chants are recorded in Latin, but some of the stories are recorded in Irish. And what's really, to me what's really interesting is that the, the resonance between them means that they were coming from the same cultural world. And the, the movement between Irish language and Latin was a very fluent one. We have lots of examples in the liturgical manuscripts of, of Latin, like the, some of the examples I gave, like the, the, the Antiphonary of Bangor, the Stowe Sto Missal, where there'll be little incipits or explanations in the Irish language. So there was an expertise that moved very easily across the two languages. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A beautiful talk and lovely singing. Um, I'm wondering, is there any evidence that you're aware of um, of the Irish monks mm -hmm. bringing back to Europe or bringing into Europe when they went Gallus and Columbus mm -hmm. and St. Gallen or Bobby or all the way through France yep. and Switzerland and Italy? Is there any evidence that they brought? Uh, this sort of panentheistic view of the mm. world, the, the love of animals, the love of food as opposed to fasting, yes. the connection with nature, yeah. eternity, fecundity, with them, that actually was re-implanted yes. in continental Europe. Well, I suppose the, the, the two sets of sources that I'm talking about tonight are the liturgical, which would come through in the chants, and then, as I said, the manuscript tradition, which, which, which were in the stories. Now, in the chant tradition, we, we certainly do have evidence of this because the, there's an older liturgical rite in Ireland called the Celtic rite. Now, unfortunately, by the time chant, we're starting to write it down around the, the 12th century, an, an, a different rite is introduced into Ireland called the Serum rite. And most of our older sources come from that period. But there are small fragments, some of which are found in continental Europe. There's, there's a whole set of fragments called the... the, the the Schottenstift, they were called. They were actually called the kind of Scottish fragments, even though they were from Irish manuscripts. And some of these have examples of, so for example, saints like Killian, who was um, um, the connection with Würzburg and with Vienna and Salzburg. And in those chants, we have these stories, these miracle stories. And as I said, what, what was striking to me about them when I looked at them is, all the miracles that you would that you would presume to find, which were which were common across Europe, but these stories about animals, the relationship with the saints, lots of those stories are preserved in the liturgical sources. So I think yes, I think we find it, and, we, and we're pretty sure that those particular monastic foundations in Europe, some of them, like the Schottenstift, were very strict about their membership. So some of them would only allow Irish membership. So we're pretty sure that the material that was written there was either written in Ireland or written by Irish monks there. And we do find that continuity of tropes and themes that we find in the Irish manuscripts in the continental sources as well. They're, they're fewer because they're quite fragmentary what we have from that period, but there is a continuity. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for a beautiful talk and some really lovely singing too. Uh, I was intrigued by the first the, the chant that you sang, the Consumatus oh for St. Michael. Yeah. It's the same tune that we use these days for the In Paradisum at the right of the burial. And Is that da 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 Yes, you're, you're, it's, it's, you're absolutely, it's modally related, that is true, yes. Really the same melody. Yeah. In paradisum de ducante aeternum. And then we have concusum es mara et contre. So I think you're, you're right there. there and it's, it's you, you, you know this, you want me to, the, the nature of modal composition is the little, the little tropes or examples we find them repeated across lots and lots. So, so one of the big questions in medieval music is, when does it become a new tune? 
So when is it very similar or related and when do we actually identify it as a new tune? So I think you're absolutely right, the, the impact <coughs> use of melody is, has, is, a, is a very close relative to the, to the, to the St. Michael one. And the, the Michael chant is, um, that, that particular one I sang, is from St. Gallen. So it's a European source. No. And the, the European sources, we tend to find them appearing more often because they travel for the, the, what we call the insular sources, so the chants that we have in Ireland. Some of those are quite distinctive and unique, like the Marian sequences I mentioned. We don't find some of them anywhere else. But the, the chants that we have for the Irish saints in continental manuscripts, we tend to find in a lot of places. So the, the Patrick one, that tune that I mentioned, is a very common, you'll hear that, you'll hear that even sung by choirs today as a, as a Christmas melody. Just a, a, a completely un, not entirely unrelated question. There's something to do with the the, um, the question about Latin and yeah. Latin almost always being used in this period as a foreign language. Wherever it is, it's going to be pronounced in different ways. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I wondered if you'd experimented with Irish ways oh, of that's... pronouncing. And, I mean, one thing we can be sure of is that uh, 14th and 15th century Irish yes, chant pronunciation, yeah, yeah. it wouldn't have been the kind of universal Italian mm. chant that we use today. Fine, but that doesn't really give us much of a clue about how it might have been. Yes, yes, yes. I, I just wondered if you'd it's, which, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, when, when I sing with the ensemble that I sing with, we tend to use a kind of Frankish pronunciation, which I actually didn't use tonight because I said, I don't think she doesn't know how to pronounce Latin at all. So when, when, we, when I sang the St. Michael, you know, um, Day send a ba, day send a ba, day send a ba, day cello. So we would sing, day send a ba, day cello. So we'd use a kind of a, the, a, as I said, a kind of a Frankish Roman pronunciation because we are reasonably sure that a lot of continental Europe was singing Latin in that way. Now, how it was being sung in Ireland at the time where we have as I said, one of, the, one of the really challenging things about the Irish sources is we have texts from the Celtic rite. We have descriptions about how they were sung, but we don't have notation until after the rite had changed. So we know that that very last chant that I sang, one of the reasons that we presume it's a very early Irish composition is that it's quite distinctive. It uses something that we find in a lot of Irish poetry. It's got a lot of assonance, a lot of alliteration, and some scholars have used the, those rhyming patterns to conjecture how the Latin might have been, might have been pronounced. But, but the, the style of poetic composition is quite distinctive. It's quite different to what we find anywhere else in, Euro in, in Europe. So I don't, I don't know that we have enough definitive information as to how Latin was actually pronounced at that time in Ireland. But as I said, in terms of the group I sing with, we tend to err towards a kind of a, 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 a middle Frankish pronunciation because we're a little bit more certain about that. But yeah, I mean, it's you're absolutely right. There was no standardized. Well, nobody's going to tell Latin. you wrong. <laughs> and we can also conjecture that there was no such thing as a universal yeah. way of pronouncing uh, Latin. Yes. From one village to the next, yes. from one generation to the next. And I, yes. It's yeah. A yeah. Yeah. Question. I mean, it's 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 always interesting, isn't it, in this early period because we're right at that hinge point between orality and literacy. Because of course, you know, this music that we're singing comes, its, its roots are in an oral tradition, aren't they? You know, there, there's, a, there's a couple of hundred years of singing this music before it's written down. And so, or, orality is really interesting because as, as you say, rightly so, it leaves a lot of room for flexibility and for change from area to area. But it can also be quite conservative. You know, if you, if you think of, a, of um, an Irish song that you know, that maybe you heard from your grandparents or your great-grandparents, orality is also very good at fixing things 
and not allowing them to change. Mm -hmm. So even though sometimes we think that that oral legacy means that there was lots of difference and lots of variations, it also can speak to a kind of a conservation of style across time and across places. So we don't, we don't really know which, which side it landed on. It's probably a combination <coughs> of both. Yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. One uh, miracle that I'm drawing just to, to conjecture about is uh, hospitality, because having spent time in Ireland yes. over many years now, mm -hmm. my wife here, yes. uh, you know, the idea of hospitality of putting the kettle down, uh, <laughs> you know, when you come yes. in. And then, you know, when I, years ago I was getting shot of whiskey when you came and visited. Yeah. Yeah. It's very different than I, other cultures. I think other cultures with Polish backgrounds and with yes. family. I think Italians more family, but I think the Irish maybe. Can you have thoughts about that? That that's part of their yes, I, uh, culture that is continued? I think I, I think it's 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 so interesting, isn't it? You know what 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 fascinates me about this, whether it's the the stories, the lives or the chants I think when we, when we look at this material in the round, it gives us a snapshot of the values of that time. Like on that, remember though, that material that I'm reading, the, the lives and the chant, this is nearly a thousand years after Patrick, isn't it? You know, so, there's, so it tells us the values of that society and what we, what we see right across the material, for example, the value of hospitality, it's written into the law, it's in the chants, it's in the songs. And I think you're absolutely right. If we were to take that same snapshot of Irish society today in terms of cultural practice around food, if we, if we were to analyze the song tradition, the story tradition, we find the values of those societies. And, and I think that we can, we can say that there's a continuity of those values. And it's, as, as I said, in, for me, looking at this material, it gives me a sense of, as I said, what was... What was wonderful enough to record in, you know, some of the most important social and ritual activities of the time, the liturgy, and in the, the heroes, the saintly, the spiritual heroes of the time and their stories, what was important to record as wonderful? Hospitality, you know, taking care of people, you know, protection, shelter, a home, family, relationship. These were the miracles. They weren't the bolts from heaven. They were having a home, having your health, having your family. That's what was miraculous. And yes, I think we can see a thread or a trace of that, you know. I'm allowed to say that, am I? You know, I try to stick to my sources and not be too <laughs> speculative. But I think, I think we have enough evidence to, to be confident about that, yeah. Um, this this uh, miracle of hospitality, as you were reciting these stories, um, reminded me of a, there's a contemporary song, I wonder if you're familiar with St. Patrick's Arrival. Oh, will you, will you sing a bit for me? Or it's very, you know, it, you know yeah. that? It's very humorous. And it's, um, part of it is where he, Go on. he, he uh, takes a quart of ale, yes, and yeah. puts it back, drinks a gallon and puts it back full on the table, and yeah. everyone has a pull from the pot, yes. and it's still overflowing at the brim. Yeah. And then his host complains that, Tomorrow is a fast, but I have nothing to eat but mutton. Uh, and, he, and Pat says, ah, bring, bring it, bring it, and he brings it and he yeah. summons it to turn into salmon. <laughs> and the leg most politely complied. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's lovely. And humor, humor. Yes, humor yeah. We find humor in the miracles. And as I said, the humor is of, often expressed with a little touch of comeuppance is there as well, as I said, in the, in the protection and the hospitality. So if you're, if you're not kind, if you don't share, if you don't care, there's a little bit of comeuppance to you, coming to you. So there's, again, and I, and I think that's interesting in terms of, you know, a, a reciprocal society, you know, where everybody's depending on each other. So you, you, we, we need that kind of hospitality because I depend on my clan or my tribe or my community for my survival. So hospitality is very, is very central to this. Um, it's a word, and as I, 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 as I said to, to Richard earlier, I'm a big, I'm a big fan of, of his work, and that I, I, I think that the use of that word in postmodern literature is a very important one because it reminds us that 
you know, etymologically hospitality, of course it's about hospital and hospice, the caring institutions, but it's also etymologically linked to hostility. It's linked to, so it's, it's a reminder, I think, that we extend the welcome not just to our community, the people with whom we have something in common, but we must extend care to the other, to the stranger as well. So I think that's a, that's a, that's a core motif in that literature, and we can trace it back, right back to this, to this um, uh, medieval period as well. Yeah. Lovely. How much you use, so the, 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 the melodies that I heard you sing, um, they didn't feel very Celtic. Yeah, uh, that's, yeah, very so interesting. Was there, are there, are there places where those, yeah. more, those melodies start to show up, or? I think that's, I, I, actually, I actually did a workshop in, um, I was in Bloomington in Indiana recently and it was, it was billed as kind of Celtic music and I think people were utterly disappointed when I came in and they were there, what, this doesn't sound at all yeah. Irish. Or, so I think that the, the kind of melodic um, associations that we often think of as Celtic um, come from a much later period. So even when we think of the dance music of Ireland, we're talking about mostly kind of 17th, 18th, 19th century. So I mean, it, it's, it is a very old music, but this is older. There are some, there's a chant that I didn't sing tonight, a chant to Killian, which um, to me, and this is, this is a European, this is, a, this is, this is from um, a Würzburg, a German source, and it's, um, Bum ba da 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 ya da 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 ya da 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 ya da kiliane ya da 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 and it it it's 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 quite related to um the the contemporary song reminds me of the she moves through the fair do you know that one yes 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 and um so there are some of the older chants where we find melodic similarities. But the, the, the kind of modes that we associate with Irish music tend to come later. This is liturgical music. So this is music that was functional. You know, it was to bring a ritual through its paces. So what I was singing you, to you for tonight were often the, the kind of musically interesting bits, the little antiphons, but there'd be long psalm verses in between a lot of these. So it comes from that liturgical side of the tradition and the, what we often think of now as Celtic music comes later. I would say, the, sorry, sorry, sorry not, to, not to interrupt you just so that I don't forget, the one exception to that is in the, the, the Shanos tradition ha, has all of these um, songs of lament. Mm -hmm. these, are, these are particularly like the lamentations around Mary, um, the, the Queena, the, 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 the lament of the three Marys, the, the seven sorrows of Mary, the seven joys, that's medieval. That's a medieval tradition. Okay. And we find those, those what we call numerical songs right across Europe. Okay. So the, it is possible that some of those are older. The, certainly the texts are. And it's possible that some of the melodies are. But the other, the other material comes later than this. Do you know how much later? The, the dance music would be that we have, say, the earliest examples we have in collections really begin around 17th, 18th century. Um, and, this is, this is, and this music that I was singing, by the time this is written down, this is probably already a couple of hundred years old. Right. So it's, it's, it's very old. The reason yeah. I ask is because I have, a, um, I have a CD that I've had a long time, and it was produced by a group at the uh, University of Notre Dame, Dante Day. Oh, okay. Yeah. And it's liturgical, and it's in yeah. Latin, but the yes. melodies are, like, listening to it, I remember the first time I listened to it, oh, there's Star of the County Down. Oh, yeah, and, yeah. And, and you, would you know, um, the, was it kind of contemporary music they were singing or historical? I'd have to. I'd have yes, because I know I know that there is a there is a folk group in in Notre Dame who do a lot of um, Celtic liturgical music, but it would probably be more contemporary composition in a in a Celtic style. If it's if it's that group, I'm not sure. It could be. Could be. Yeah. It could be. I could share it with you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Lovely. Lovely. Yeah. Just. Um, Back to their, you know, offices of any sort, the same bridge as a fight. 
it's yeah. spectacular because it most is. of the most of the things we have are written in a more patriarchal culture. So yeah. most of, there must have been pretty something pretty special about Bridget yeah. that they thought, well, it's worth seeing you this one. Yeah. Mm. yeah. It is spectacular. And also the, the kinds of stories that have been preserved in the office and in the stories are quite radical because as I said, I gave I gave a couple of examples, but of all the saints, the stories around Bridget are the ones that connect the pre-Christian with the Christian most consistently. And that is, as I said, the, the, the link with a kind of a Druidic culture and, and Bridget's interaction with that, the, the metaphor of, of fertility and lactation and that material, but also, you know, those stories about how actually, actually Bridget was ordained a bishop, you know, so these, these are, and these are in the offices. These are in the liturgical chant, some of these, you know, because we, so much of this has, has survived in folklore that it, I think very often people don't realize that they're, they're, in our, they're in our medieval sources, they're in the liturgy. And one of the things that I find quite intriguing about the saints' offices is when this new rite came into Ireland, and it was part of, in the 12th century, it was part of a whole standardization of liturgy. And so a, a liturgical form came in from Salisbury, the Sarum rite, right across Ireland, and pretty much over time eradicated the Celtic rite except for the saints' offices. And why was that? Because imagine you bring in a whole new rite from another culture, another country. It'll have the liturgical cycle. It'll have Christmas and Easter and Pentecost and Ascension. But what it won't have are the local saints. So the, where, where did those offices come from? Were they, did they say, oh, we have this new rite. We better write a few new offices for the saints. Or did, much more likely did they say, hang on, we already have those. So let's bring those in. So even though these, these saints' offices are in the Sarum Rite, there's a lot of evidence to suggest they are our oldest liturgical layer. Mm -hmm. So that they, they might capture something of an earlier tradition that we don't find. There's some really great work done by some um, Irish American musicologists like um, Patrick Brannan and Sarah Gibbs who, who have talked about these, these saints' offices. So they're very, they're very tantalizing because they, they, they are very probably a trace of an older a liturgical tradition. And to have a, to have a, a, a female saint that is, ex, that is very dominant in that tradition. And also the number of sources that she appears in. Now she appears in, you know, that that's often can be an indicator of things as well, can't it? You know, if, it, if it's one source, it you know, could be interesting. But if it's in several sources, it was more than interesting, it was widespread. Mm -hmm. And she appears in the wash. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was there any news that, that actually came down from the Book of Kells, from the Druids, that still survived? Any music? Yeah. No, un unfortunately, and this is this is this is a source of great frustration <laughs> to 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 musicians. And I, I, as I said, I teach a, a program in the in the University of Limerick. I teach um, a program in ritual studies. I don't think a year goes by when a student doesn't come in and say, "I want to do my thesis on Celtic chant. <laughs> Tell me the sources." <laughs> and every year, I have to say sit down <laughs> you're going to be very disappointed we 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 do not have no chance now as i said it's not all is not lost we have texts we have a huge number of texts in actual fact from the pre serum celtic period very intriguing texts for example in the irish material there's a there's very strong evidence of a tradition of hymn singing which might seem not very exciting to you, but I'll tell you why it is. Hymn singing was a feature of the Eastern Church. It wasn't so much a feature of the Western Church. One of the oldest Eucharistic hymns that we have in the Western Church comes from an Irish source, but we have the text. So what we, as, as musicologists, what we try to do is we have later sources that have melodies and we try to say, well, what would happen if we match that with an earlier text? But the actual music of the Celtic rite, if we have it at all, I, I think there's like really compelling reasons to think that we have it in the saints' offices. I think mean, that's where the trace resides. So 
Yeah, so the, the, the Book of Kells doesn't actually have any music in it. So it's, a, it's, a, it's more of a, of a gospel book and it has, of course, these extraordinary illuminations. And as I was saying there, are one of the things, I think if you, if you look at these as a composite, if we look at text, we look at the visual imagery we have, we listen to the songs we have, and we combine those, we can make informed conjecture about what the world, that world might have sounded like. Uh, what that world might have that okay? sounded like. There we go. I'm looking for something to wrap. Yeah. Stay there for a minute, please, because I think we want to thank you with the warmth that's in our hearts and the smiles in our faces and our hands. You, you alluded to a conjecture, Helen, in your talk about um, about paradise being terrestrial and it being in the east. And I think I heard a legend of St. Columkill saying, well, the east in that case would be on the east side of Hammond Street in this room with your presence. And you brought it to us in paradise. So really thank you. Thank Helen, you. Great. 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 Thank you. Good. Thank you so, so much. Please stay and enjoy a little more conversation. I know you're traveling. You may have to slip out at a certain point here, but they're for the rest of their coffee and uh, some brownies, and please stay and enjoy each other's company. So, and, and Sheila, again, the next scale is March 19, March 19. right? There we are. Thank Good. you. Thank you. Thank you.